good. Everything on? All right. Welcome to our, well, we've already started our next semester. It's officially started Sunday, as I'm sure you're aware, but this is our first time meeting on Thursday evening. Glad you can be here. Missing quite a few people, a couple people out of town, a couple people not able to be here, but we appreciate you coming. I'm very excited for another semester of the Bear Trail Bible Institute, and I trust that you are as well. I can tell by your excited faces that you just cannot wait. Before we begin, in the book of Matthew, that's where we'll be this evening first, the book of Matthew. But before we go there, let's let's talk about a couple things just to keep in mind at the beginning of a Bible school semester. Come to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, a very familiar verse, but I want to get a particular a particular uh, application from it. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, and look down at verse number 15. Study, study. That's what you're going to have to do this semester. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What I want you to get from that, what I want you to really focus in on and think about as it pertains to your Bible study, is the fact that this verse says that you need to show yourself or thyself approved unto God. If you do your studies and make your hundreds or make your whatever your good grades are, you make your grades so that you can be approved unto me or you can be approved unto your pastor or so you can be approved unto your parents or you can be approved unto a mission board or a church someday. You're totally out of focus. You're totally out of whack. You're, you're, you're looking at the wrong thing and studying for the wrong reasons. When you approach your Bible study, when you approach the material we cover tonight, and you, you go tonight or tomorrow night or whenever it is you do your study time, and you open that thing up and you pour over that material and you commit it to memory, your goal should be pleasing and satisfying and working in such a way that will make you approved unto God and not unto man. Any, but look, there's been many, many people I've known, I've personally known multiple people who got very, very good grades in Bible school, but their lives were not particularly approved by God. I've seen lots of people who can study their Bible and study their Bible well, and you know people who are familiar with the facts of the Scripture, but they're studying to show themselves approved unto other people. They're studying so they could show themselves to be smarter than someone else. They're studying so they could win an argument. They're studying so they could get a position. They're studying so they could fulfill some obligation because I said, I, I said I'd teach Sunday schools and all I have to do is so let me study so I can have a good message so everybody will know that I'm a good preacher doing all those things, but not studying to show themselves approved unto God. If you're going to be a true Bible student and find Bible study enjoyable and satisfactory, then you're going to have to study to show yourself approved unto God. It's easy when you're in Bible school to get caught up in the numbers, get caught up in the tests, get caught up with putting out fires, just trying to keep up. I understand that. And, and there is some motivation to be found in those things. You want to get good grades. You want to do the best you can. Maybe a little competition helps you do better. I want to try to do just as good as so-and-so or a little better than so-and-so. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But remember, this isn't school. This isn't high school. This isn't college. This is Bible study. And so there's something more than just doing well. There's, there's, a, there's a relationship with God that should be fostered through the knowledge that you get here. Come to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Here's the second thing I want you to notice. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. 'll get verse number nine. Did I say second Corinthians? I meant first Corinthians if I said second. First Corinthians chapter two, verse number nine. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. That's in Isaiah 64. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searcheth, searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So you need to remember when you approach this Bible, you're not approaching the work of a man. You're not approaching a carnal thing. You're not approaching a textbook. You need to approach this book as it is in truth, the word of God, and understand 
that if you try to understand the truths of the Word of God simply in the power of man, simply in the power of your flesh, simply in your own wisdom, you won't be successful in that pursuit. If you try to get Bible knowledge just, just in your own smarts, by your own power, by your own study time, your own grit, and I'm going to stay up late, and I'm going to work hard, and I'm going to gather all this truth, you'll know the Bible like a college student knows a textbook. And no college student has a really good, blossoming, working relationship with a textbook or with the author of the textbook. We want something more when you are studying this Bible than just a head knowledge of the facts so we can pass a test. You need to understand when you approach the truths in this book, it's going to be necessary that you're not just approaching this with human understanding. You are going to need to work with the Spirit of God that is in you in order to understand these deep spiritual truths. The Bible says, verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. If you approach this book as a man, you will not be able to understand the spiritual truths that are in this book. But if you approach this book with the Holy Spirit, with acknowledging God and the fact that he's the one that can teach, God will teach you this book. The author of this book inside of you will work with you to teach you the deep things of God. Keep reading. Look at verse number 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. According to the scriptures, there are some things in this book that cannot be understood simply by a man trying to learn them. It is necessary that you have the Holy Spirit in you teaching you the things that are inside this book. So I encourage you as you approach this semester to study. To study, to show yourself approved, not unto man, unto God, and make sure that you're not pursuing this in your own power. Give it your best. Give it your all. Give everything you got. But understand that it's going to be necessary that the Lord is in you teaching you these things and not just you trying to cram them in your head in the power of the flesh. It's a wonderful truth that God will teach you this book. Uh, as you read it and as you study it, that's, that's, that's an amazing thing. And so I hope you take full advantage of that. Now, let's come to Matthew, the book of Matthew. Book of Matthew, chapter number one. We are, we are hardly going to get into the book. Really, we're not, going to, we're not going to get into the actual text of the book until next week. We've got lots and lots of, of, of introductory material in both these classes. Matthew first will be an Old Testament survey uh, three for our, our second hour. But let's go, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his blessing on this evening. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be here for another semester. What a blessing, Lord. Thank you for everybody that's going to be taking this class. Lord, thank you for everybody that's just going to be listening. What a blessing that people are, are willing and desirous to hear truth taught from your word. God, we ask and pray that you'd help us this evening to say only things that would honor and glorify you. Would you help me as I try to teach? Give me the words to say to be able to teach your word in a way that's understandable and interesting and thought-provoking, in a way that would honor and glorify you. We ask that you'd help us in our studies this semester, help us to learn more from your word, help us to come away from this semester being better Christians and knowing more about you and understanding more about you than when we start. And Lord, more than anything, we thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, we've got a lot of uh, material to cover in these, both of these classes, especially Matthew. When we get down to it tomorrow and start this actual text, I did the math, and there's, I can't remember how many verses, but I do remember that in order for us to cover the entire book of Matthew verse by verse with 11 weeks, if you don't count this week with introductory material, we're going to have to cover 90-something verses in a night. And you know as well as I that that's not going to happen, so we're going we're gonna to try to hit the highlights, the things that, well, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but we, we, like, we got a lot of material to cover, but I don't want you to hesitate from stopping, raising your hand, 
asking questions, if you need a cross-reference, if you've missed a point, any of that type of thing. We're not in so much of a hurry that we can't teach you the Bible at, at Bible school. The goal here is, is to learn the scripture, not to check a box and said we went through this many verses. So if you have a question about something, if you didn't fully understand a, a concept, if you need me to go back and say something again, feel free. Don't be shy. There's no stupid questions, just stupid people. So <laughs> feel, feel free to, to ask any questions you have or get with me after. There's always, always that time as well. All right, the book of Matthew. Your Bible, as I'm sure you know, contains two main divisions. There's, there's many, many divisions in the Word of God, but there's, there's one, one very, very large and uh, main division in the Scriptures, and that's the division of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Fundamental, basic knowledge. When you were in Sunday school, you learned about there's an Old Testament and there's a New Testament. When you read your Bible you come to the book of Malachi, okay? The book of Malachi is firmly planted in the Old Testament. You know that doctrinally and positionally, the book of Malachi is very, very much Old Testament scripture, Old Testament law. Now, when you come to the New Testament, when you get to the book of Romans, you are now firmly planted in the New Testament. You've got New Testament, church age, doctrine and teaching. It's, it's fair game when you get to the book of Romans. Now you say, what about in between those two? In between Malachi and Romans, we have what we call the four gospels and the book of Acts. Now some of this is gonna be review from, from the Acts class. But this is what you need to know about these four books. These four books form a bridge or form a transition between the Old and the New Testaments. These four books form a bridge or a transition between the Old and the New Testaments. And the first step on that transitional bridge is the book of of Matthew. Now, what do we mean by bridge? You have Old Testament, you have God mainly, and this is review, we've said this a million times, but this is, this is so important. You need, to, you need to know this, you need to understand this. In the Old Testament, you have God mainly dealing with the nation of Israel, and you have God dealing mainly with that nation by the law. Okay, God judges them and deals with them by the law. He's not really dealing with the Gentiles, only really so much as the Gentiles come in contact with the Jew. And from, from Genesis chapter 12 all the way up to the book of Malachi, you have God dealing with the nation of Israel in an Old Testament manner. And we're going to go from that to God sending his son into the world, setting that aside and saying, now you're saved by grace through faith, believing in Jesus Christ only, and we're going to have a church, we're not going to have a nation, and now we're not going to be worrying about physical any longer, we're going to be worrying about spiritual, and we're not going to be worried about that Old Testament, we're going to be in a New Testament. And it only stands to reason that God would not make such a radical change like that. That is not going, this is something people can't get through their, their brains because they're in their Bible and they say, well, here it says Old Testament and I turn the page and it says New Testament. So now we're in the New Testament. That's not how it works in the scripture. God is not going to go from dealing nationally with a physical people to dealing spiritually with all people overnight, turning one page, there's going to be some transition that has to take place in order for God to get from that place to this place, in order for God to get from something like the Old Testament to something that's, that's flowing from the Old Testament and connected to the Old Testament, but still in a lot of ways radically different from the Old Testament, there's going to have to be some transition. And that's what you see in the four Gospels and the book of Acts. And Matthew's placement in the canon of Scripture should be the first thing to alert you to its uniqueness and importance. 
if God is transitioning so radically from the Old Testament to the New, from a focus on the Jew and the physical land to a focus on the Christian and the spiritual salvation, one would guess that the first book that addresses this transition would be of particular importance, and that guess is absolutely correct. Yet these four books, five books that form a bridge between the Old and the New, the first one is Matthew, and the fact that it's the first out of those five should really key you in on the fact that it's probably important, probably something unique, probably something you need to be paying attention to, and, and that's very, very true when you come to the book of Matthew. I want you to understand this before we go any farther, and we'll, we'll say this again in a little bit. We're not saying that these five books are, are trash, throw them away, they're, they're, not, they're not useful. They're the words of God, but you just need to be careful in them because they're not necessarily, not everything that happens in those books are doctrinal instruction for where we are now. Does that make sense? Just because it happened in the book of Matthew doesn't mean it continues happening now. Just because Jesus taught something in the book of Mark or the book of Matthew doesn't mean that's what the New Testament church is supposed to be doing right now. There's lots of things to keep an eye on in the transitional, those transitional periods. Preacher, preacher said this in the, in the Acts, uh, first introduction to the Acts class. It's very good. I'll repeat it. You don't build a house on a bridge. If you have a firm piece of land here and a firm piece of land here, you build your house over here or you build your house over there. No smart person would get on that bridge and build their home there. Remember when we were in, in, where were we, Tennessee, and they had that big, long cable bridge? What happened when you got to the middle of that bridge? Very unstable footing. You're moving around. You're, it's, it's not solid ground. What happened when you got off the bridge on the other end? Now you had some firm, solid ground to work with. That would be where you'd want to stay. You wouldn't want to hang out long in the middle of that bridge because it's, it's unstable. We're in no way saying that these books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, are not the Word of God. We're in no way saying that they're not important. We're also not saying that there's nothing in there for us. There's lots of doctrine for the New Testament church in those books. Okay, we don't want to say that, well, it's in, it's in Mark, so it's not for us. That's not at all what we're saying. There's lots of things that apply to us very much so in these books. You just need to be careful, and you need to rightly divide them. You can't go in there. This is where people make mistakes. You can't go into those books and say, anything they say is all for me. Or you can also can't go in those books and say, well, nothing they say is all for me. You need to, you need to think about it, put scripture with scripture, and, and rightly divide the word of truth. The book of Matthew is a wonderful book. When rightly divided, the book of Matthew contains keys that will unlock many other parts of the Bible. But when it's wrongly divided, the book of Matthew can become a dungeon that brings about confusion and false doctrine. There are countless, countless false doctrines that have their origins or their, their teachings from people use the book of Matthew. With the exception of maybe the book of Acts, there is no other book in Scripture that has caused more misunderstanding and false doctrine than the book of Matthew. Now, again, I want to be clear when we say that we're not saying that there's anything wrong with the book of Matthew or anything wrong with the book of Acts or anything wrong with the book of Hebrews. They are the word of God. They're 100% true. They're 100% right. And they're 100% exactly how God wanted them to be said. But the problem occurs when people misuse or misapply the truth that is contained in these books. Listen, the Bible tells you, the Bible says to build an ark, but it does not tell you to build an ark. I could, I could rightly say that the Bible says to build an ark, but I could not rightly say, so that means I need to go out and build an ark. The scripture does say to build an ark, but it's not saying that to me. It's saying it to Noah. If I were to take Noah's instruction and apply it to myself, I would be misapplying the Bible and wrongly dividing the word of truth, okay? The Bible says to exterminate the Canaanites from out of the land. That is true. That is 100% the word of God. God's word says to exterminate the Canaanites. It just doesn't say it to me. 
And if I were to go to Palestine and start shooting people because I was trying to exterminate the Canaanites, I would be wrongly dividing the word of truth. It does say that. It doesn't say it to me. So a lot of people will go to the book of Matthew and say, well, it's the Bible. You're saying Matthew's not the Bible. It's a great book. It's just as much Bible as any other book of the Bible. And they're right. It is just as much Bible as any other book of the Bible. But if I take things from that book that weren't intended for the New Testament Christian and make them New Testament doctrine and practice them in my church, I'm going to be in a whole lot of trouble. We're going to see that as we go through, talk about a lot more of those things. Everything in the book of Matthew is true. You need to be careful to make sure you aren't misusing or misapplying that truth. Um, as we are going to study in a minute, this is important, you're probably going to write this down. Matthew is a very Jewish book and emphasizes Jesus Christ as the king of the earth, king uh, of earthly physical people and in the earthly physical kingdom. Of heaven. Matthew is a, uh, a very Jewish book and emphasized Jesus Christ as the king of an earthly physical people in an earthly physical kingdom of heaven. So you can see why this leads to confusion. You have a book that is about the life of Jesus and what the publishers have called the New Testament, but the emphasis of this book is is how Jesus Christ the King relates to his physical people and a physical kingdom. You can see why people are, are confused. They, they, they turn the page. It says New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they turn the next page and they say, oh, this is talking about the birth of Jesus Christ. And this is talking about the life of Jesus Christ. And here's the parables that I've heard so much about. And here's Jesus dealing with the Pharisees. And here's Jesus being betrayed. And here's Jesus going to the cross and dying for my sins and rising from the dead. The book of Matthew is all about Jesus' life and it's in the New Testament, so it must be for me. Yes and no, because even though it is in the New Testament and even though it is about Jesus' life, uh, life, death, burial, and resurrection, it has a very Jewish emphasis and a very Jewish flavor to it, and it's, it's primarily written to and about Jesus Christ being the king of his physical earthly people. So it's very, very important that you make that distinction as you read through this book. The New Testament church is spiritual, not physical, and trying to apply Jewish kingdom of heaven truths to the spiritual church of God would be and often is, always is, disastrous. But because Matthew is considered by many to be just as New Testament as Romans or Ephesians, many Christians and Bible teachers wrongly divide this book to their own hurt and to the hurt of those who follow them. But we're trying to, to drill through your head so you'll never, ever, 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 ever forget it till you're, till you're dead and in the grave is that you can't approach Matthew with the same attitude that you approach Romans. You can't approach Matthew with the same attitude that you'd approach the book of Colossians, okay? The emphasis of this book, the flavor of this book, the theme of this book is Jesus Christ, but it's Jesus Christ as he pertains and relates to his physical, earthly people. It's not so much, it doesn't show Jesus Christ as the Savior of the Gentiles as much as it shows Jesus Christ as the Messiah of the Jews. And so if you approach it with a New Testament mindset, you can get in some, some murky waters and some trouble that quickly get cleared up if you remember the theme of the book and, and uh, the the emphasis of the book. Now, before we bear that thought out any farther, we'll talk more about all that in a moment. Let's go to the other side of the road and make another very important observation. When we say that Matthew's emphasis is Jewish and kingdom of heaven and physical, that does not mean that Matthew is exclusively Jewish and kingdom and physical. The book does contain some important truth for the New Testament church. And even the parts that are Jewish in nature are informative for us and can help us understand more of the Bible, even if they are not ours in practice. Let me, let me try to find a verse here. I meant to write this verse down. I believe we're going to find it in... I 
think it's in chapter number, let's see here. Hmm. Oh man. Uh, somebody with a with a concordance or a Bible app or something like that, find me the story of the woman that came to Jesus Christ and asked for the healing of her daughter when Jesus Christ called her a dog. Somebody find that for me. Somebody find that story for me. It goes, it goes right along with what we're trying to teach here. I apologize. I know what side of the page it's on. I'm not seeing it. What's that? Yes. Chapter 15. Okay. Uh, there it is. It's on the same side of the page I thought it was. There it is. Okay. So what we're talking about is, is the book of Matthew primarily emphasis Jewish, but not entirely. See, a lot of people intend to take the book of Matthew and just throw it out or avoid it or get scared of it or kind of tread lightly with it because they know that there's some things in there that seem a little different than the rest of the books, and there's some, some things in there that I don't really understand. It seems really weird that Jesus would say that, so we just kind of throw it out. But there's lots in there, just because it's primarily Jewish emphasis, there's lots in there that can still be applied to the church. Look what uh, the Bible says in chapter 15, look at verse 21. Then Jesus went thence to depart into the coast of Tyre at Sidon, and behold, a woman of Canaan, came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So, so far, it's, it's very Matthew. I mean, Jesus turns to this Gentile and says, I'm not dealing with you right now. I'm here for Israel. And that's something you'd expect to see in the book of Matthew with a Jewish emphasis and an, an Israel emphasis and a kingdom of heaven emphasis, a physical emphasis. He says, no, this isn't for you. I'm here for my people. I'm dealing with the Jews right now. You go on. And then, she, uh, then came she and worshipped him and saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. And Jesus Christ, after he just got done telling this lady, this is not for you. This is not your time. This is not your dispensation. This is not your emphasis. Jesus Christ, when he sees the faith of this woman, says, well, you know what? I'm God and I can do what I want. I'll just step outside of this dispensational line for a second and help this lady out because I'm good and because I'm loving. And then I'll get right back to Israel. So what we're trying to show you is, yes, when God wrote the book of Matthew, he was dealing primarily with the nation of Israel. But that does not mean that God's not allowed to step out of that framework and throw a little bit of New Testament doctrine in there. And he's, he's allowed to, although the primary emphasis of the book is Jewish and not church, he's allowed to include a lot of things in there that are very helpful to the church. When we, I'm a dispensationalist. I believe in, I believe, and when you say that, you need to define that because everybody that says that means a different thing. But, but if, if, if I gave you the definition of what I mean by dispensationalist, you'd agree you're a dispensationalist too. What I mean is there's divisions in the Bible. God dealt with different people in different ways throughout history. Duh. Obvious. God doesn't deal with me the same way he dealt with Abraham. God doesn't deal with me the same way that he dealt with Cain and Abel. Okay? Totally different dispensation. God doesn't deal with us the same way that he dealt with Adam and Eve. Different dispensations. But sometimes, sometimes we're guilty of making those dispensational lines brick walls through which nothing can pass, not even God. 
And I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but God wasn't reading Larkin when he wrote the Bible. God, we, we, like, those, we like those lines, and they're generally right, but they are man-made. They're based in Scripture. But God didn't write dispensational truth. A man wrote it, okay? So there's some instances where you need to recognize the fluidity of Scripture and the fact that God can work outside of, of man-made boundaries. We say from here to here is this dispensation, from here to here is this dispensation, and Matthew is Jewish in emphasis and primarily dealing with the Jew, and the key word there is primarily. There's going to be instances where it's, where it's also dealing with the Gentile and even setting forth some church doctrine. Okay, so remember that as you study the book of Matthew and as you deal with people in the book of Matthew and as we uh, go through this class. Now, let's talk about a few very important introductory truths concerning the book of Matthew. Some of not, uh, if not all of this material will be familiar to you because we talked about it in other classes, but we cannot risk going into the book of Matthew without a thorough understanding of these things. So if you've heard this stuff taught before by me or someone else, just consider them a reminder and a refresher. Ooh, thunder, raining. Hopefully we don't lose power. Let's talk about the beginning of of the New Testament, the beginning of the New Testament. I know we talked about this, I think it was last semester or maybe the semester before, I think it was two semesters ago, but it's really important, especially in a book like Matthew, so we're going to go over it again. If I were to ask you if the book of Matthew was Old Testament or New Testament, you would probably say that the book of Matthew is in the New Testament, and you'd be mostly technically, you'd be correct because Matthew is in the half of the Bible that we refer to as the New Testament, or a little less than half. You, you know what I meant. The, the, the side of the, it's on this side of the Bible and not that side of the Bible. It's a, it's a New Testament book. You'd be correct in a sense because after Malachi, but before Matthew, you have a page of your Bible that says the New Testament. Any book after that point is said to be in the New Testament. But the word testament means more than just a division in the books of your Bible. Doctrinally, the word testament is used to distinguish God's dealings with man. The word testimony is used to distinguish God's dealings with man. The Old Testament being the old way God dealt with man through the law, and the New Testament being the new way that God deals with man through grace and truth in Christ Jesus. The dictionary says the word testament is interchangeable with the word covenant, if that gives you a better idea. The old covenant, you just replace the word testament with covenant. The old covenant was the law with the Jews. The new covenant is by grace through faith with whosoever will. Now, now just to avoid confusion, we're not talking about salvation. We're not saying people got saved through the law and now they get saved through faith. We're talking about the way that God dealt with people, he dealt with them through the law, and now he deals with them in a, in a different manner now. It is extremely important to see when this New Testament or this New Covenant began, or when did God move away from the Old Covenant and institute the New. Come to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter number 9. You need to know this. You need to know this. Not just for a test, if you're going to rightly divide the word of truth. Hebrews chapter 9, look at verse number 16. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon there neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, so on, so forth. So the New Testament, doctrinally speaking, began with the death of Jesus Christ. The Bible says a testament is not a force until the death of a testator. The New Testament was not started until its testator, Jesus Christ, died. Until his blood was shed. The, 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 the passage goes on to talk about the shedding of blood that began the first Old Testament. And then when Jesus died and shed his blood, that began the second or the New Testament or the New Covenant. So that means... From Matthew chapter 1 to Matthew chapter 27, when Jesus Christ dies, you are still 
technically in the Old Testament. And then for a little space there, you're in the New Testament and you turn the page to Mark chapter 1 and technically, doctrinally speaking, you're back in the Old Testament. Guys, that's so important because you can't turn your page in the book of Matthew and say, well, I'm in Matthew chapter 4. I'm in Matthew chapter 5, 6. I'm in Matthew 24. I'm in Matthew chapter 13. I'm in Matthew 10. This is New Testament. You're not in the New Testament. You're in what we would say, turn to your New Testament, but doctrinally speaking, you're not in the New Testament, you're in the Old Testament. When you're having so much trouble in Matthew 24 trying to figure out what all that's about, you're in the Old Testament. When you're in Matthew 10 scratching your head, why God would, would not go to all the world and just go to the Jews, doesn't Jesus love everybody? You're in the Old Testament. So it's a very, very important truth to remember. So great care must be taken when studying the Gospels, particularly the Gospel of Matthew, because you aren't reading a book of doctrine from the New Testament church. Technically, you're reading a historical account that occurred in the Old Testament, and just because something is said in one of the Gospels doesn't mean it's intended to be said or done in the New Testament church. Did Jesus say things during his life on earth that was intended for the church? Absolutely he did. Did Jesus say things that we take to heart now and apply to our lives now? Absolutely. It's the, he's the foundation of, of everything we do and everything we say is, is Jesus Christ and his word. But you also consider this in the book of Matthew. You have Jesus keeping the Sabbath and attending a synagogue. So what, are we supposed to keep the Sabbath and attend, the, to attend a synagogue? Because we're, follow, well, we're supposed to follow in the footsteps of Christ and everything Jesus did. That's what I do. So I'm off to the synagogue and I'm going to keep the Sabbath day and I'm going to that all gets cleared up when you remember, oh, wait, until he died, it was still the Old Testament. So, of course, he was going to synagogue. Of course, he was keeping the law. Of course, he was keeping the Sabbath. That's Old Testament, and that's where he was. Okay, so not everything that's said or done in the Gospels are for us just because it's on this side of the book of Malachi. Let's talk about, with what little time we have remaining here, kingdom of God versus kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of God versus kingdom of heaven. I'm going, to get, I'm going to do my best here, okay? I'm going to do my best. This is something that you're going to get by repetition. This is something that the more you hear it, the more it's going to click, the more you're going to see it, the more you're going to understand it. I still have questions about some of these things and how you can apply it all to Scripture. But at the same time, this is, this is so, so important. This, honestly, honestly, kingdom of God versus kingdom of heaven is, I think... Physical versus spiritual, I think the key that unlocks the scripture. I mean, really, more than anything, if you can understand this concept, you will eliminate so many questions and so many issues and so many, so many confusing things in the Bible. If you understand the difference between God dealing with his physical earthly people and God dealing with his spiritual heavenly people. It's, it's a must. So let's, let's start talking about this. As you read the Gospels, you will encounter two phrases. One phrase, the kingdom of God, and one phrase, the kingdom of heaven. It is vitally important to your study of the Bible to know what these kingdoms are and to realize that these two kingdoms are not the same. These two kingdoms are not the same. I don't care what your seminary taught. I don't care what the book you read said. The modern, the normal teaching is, oh, you can't even God, the kingdom of heaven, they're, they're both the same thing. Don't worry about it. And if you, you need to worry about it because God knows what God is and God knows what heaven is and he could have he used two different words for a reason. And that becomes abundantly clear when you study them out and, and, and look at them in the Scripture. Now again, we could spend a lot of time doing in-depth study on these two kingdoms, but for our purposes, we're going to give a simple explanation of each and talk about how that relates to the book of Matthew. Let's start by talking about the kingdom of heaven. We might go a little long in this class because I think we'll go a little short in the other one. we we got to really take our time in this stuff and, and understand it. Because we talk about heaven and going to heaven when we die, 
People assume when they're reading their scripture and they come to the term kingdom of heaven, they assume that that refers to heaven. That's the kingdom of heaven. That's God's kingdom somewhere in the sky in a far off place. And when I die, I'm going to go to the kingdom of heaven because that's, that's where God lives. That's his kingdom. That's his place. And so people assume that heaven and the kingdom of heaven are one and the same. And to enter into the kingdom of heaven means going to heaven when you die. You're going to encounter that phrase often in the book of Matthew, enter into the kingdom of heaven. If you do this, you'll enter into the kingdom of heaven. He did that, and so he was not allowed to enter into the kingdom of heaven. That does not mean going to heaven when you die. When the book talks about somebody entering into the kingdom of heaven in the book of Matthew, that is not talking about you going to be with Jesus when you die one day. Come to Matthew chapter 11. What is, what is the kingdom of heaven? Matthew chapter number 11. According to the Bible, I'm going to give you this definition. and We'll look at this verse. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is the physical ruling power on this earth. The kingdom of heaven is the physical ruling government or power upon this earth. When Nebuchadnezzar had control of the whole world, he was the main power. You know what he had? He had control of the kingdom of heaven. When Rome took possession of the entire earth, Rome was in possession, was the ruling power, was the leader or the possessor of the kingdom of heaven, according to the biblical definition. Now, Rome or Greece or Persia or Babylon, they were not in control of the third heaven, obviously, but they were control of this physical earth down here, and so they were the ruling power or the, the ones in control of the kingdom of heaven. You say, where do we get that? Matthew chapter 11, look at verse number 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. If you're going to make the kingdom of heaven the third heaven, this verse makes absolutely no sense. If you're going to make the kingdom of heaven the heaven in which God lives, this verse is totally nonsense. This verse is saying that violent people take the kingdom of heaven by for force. If you're going to make that the third heaven, you're going to say that somebody could march into God's throne room and violently take it over by force and kick God out and take over the third heaven. That ain't going to happen. We know that for a fact that that's never going to happen. So what does this mean? It's got to mean, it's got to mean the physical kingdoms upon this earth. When the Bible speaks of the kingdom of heaven, it's talking about the earth and the physical kingdoms therein. According to the Bible, kingdom of heaven, physical ruling power on this earth. The Bible says right now, the kingdom of heaven belongs to the Gentiles. That's Luke 21 and verse number 24. Let's read that, Luke 21. Luke chapter number 21. Right now, the kingdom of heaven is in possession of the Gentiles. It's not in possession of the Jew. And in, in a sense, it's not in possession of the Lord. Okay, I don't mean that in a, in a sacrilegious way. He's in control of how this whole thing's going to go. But the Lord's not currently in possession of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus Christ is going to come back and physically set up his government on this earth. And then Jesus Christ will be the ruler, the king of the kingdom of heaven. He'll set his people up as the head and not the tail, the Bible says. And so that's where we'll, we'll get to all that. See, it's, it, 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 it's hard to explain it without getting way ahead of yourself. Look at Luke 21, verse number 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So when you're looking at the kingdom of heaven and you're looking, okay, you go back to the book of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar's image and you've got Babylon and you've got Media Persia and you've got Greece and you've got Rome and then you have... 
Who's in possession of it now, according to the Bible? The Gentiles. This is the time of the Gentiles. The Gentiles are currently in control of the kingdom of this earth, which the Bible refers to as the kingdom of heaven. The Jews, the Jews, uh, well, uh, it currently belongs to the Gentiles, but it will ultimately be given to the Jew with Jesus Christ sitting on the throne of David. Come to Isaiah chapter 9. So, the promise to the Jew, the promise of the Scripture is that this physical earth down here eventually will be given to the nation of Israel, will be given to the Jewish people, and Jesus Christ will sit upon the throne physically ruling His physical people in the kingdom of heaven. Look at Matthew, uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Okay, so go back to what we said about entering into the kingdom of heaven. When the Bible in the book of Matthew talks about somebody entering into the kingdom of heaven, it's not talking about the salvation of one's soul. It's talking about whether or not a nation or a person gets to participate in the physical, earthly kingdom that Jesus Christ will have upon this earth. Does that make sense? Kingdom of heaven physical, earthly. When the Bible talks about Jesus taking possession of the kingdom of heaven, it's talking about Jesus coming to this earth and setting up his throne here. The Jews are promised that their Messiah would come back and defeat their enemies and put their nation in charge of the kingdom of heaven. That's not our promise. That's not our concern. But the nation of Israel was promised all the way back in the scriptures that their Messiah would come one day and set them up as the ruling nation, the, the owners, the possessors of the physical earth, the kingdom of heaven. Come to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter number 7. Look at verse number 12. I hope this is, this is making some sense. Look at verse number 12. And when thy days be fulfilled... And thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chase him with the rod of men, with stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul when I put it away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established Forever before thee, thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. So Nathan the prophet speaks unto David in the name of the Lord by the word of the Lord and says, I'm going to establish your throne. I'm going to establish your kingdom and you will have a seed to reign on this throne forever. Thy throne shall be established forever. Okay, so that's the promise of the Jew that the seed of David will sit upon a throne forever. And ultimately, we know that that, that prophecy, that promise is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ when he sits upon his earthly physical throne in the kingdom of heaven. Now come to Jeremiah chapter 23. Book of Jeremiah chapter number 23. This is the promise to the Jew. Look at verse number 5, Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby we shall be called the Lord our righteousness. God in the book of Jeremiah promised 
to the Jews that he would raise by the seed of David a righteous branch and he will be a king who will reign and prosper and will execute judgment where? In the earth. That's fulfilled when Jesus sits on his physical throne in the kingdom of heaven. So it's almost as though you've got, you've got two themes running through the scripture. It's almost as though you have two plots that are, are gloriously intertwined and work together, but you have this theme of Jesus Christ sitting upon his throne and fulfilling his promises to his physical people upon the earth, but at the same time you have this theme of Jesus Christ coming to this earth and dying for the sins of all mankind and redeeming them by his blood. And ultimately, at the end of, of the book, at the end of time, those two themes come together and, and make what we know as, as eternity. Now come to Daniel chapter 7. Book of Daniel, chapter 7. Look at verse number 13. I saw the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion, and glory, and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So the promise of God to the nation of Israel, to the Jew, is that one day they would be given a Messiah who would reign as their king on the physical earth that he would set up a government and a kingdom and put them as the head, the top nation, and give them control of this earth. That is what is referred to in the scripture as the kingdom of heaven. Now, interestingly, this is where it gets, this is where it gets cool and really ties into what we're talking about. The phrase kingdom of heaven, all together is one phrase, the kingdom of heaven, appears 32 times in the Bible. All 32 of those times are in the book of Matthew. The phrase kingdom of heaven does not appear anywhere else in the scripture except the book of Matthew. Now, is that not fascinating to know that the kingdom of heaven is talking about God as his, Jesus Christ as the king ruling on earth with his physical people, the Jews. And then you open the book of Matthew and it's all about the kingdom of heaven and it shows Jesus Christ as the king dealing with his physical people in a physical sense. It all just ties together so perfectly. That's why it's so important to have an understanding of this when you approach the book of Matthew. It, it, you're going to get confused if you don't understand that. 32 times in just 28 chapters, that word kingdom of heaven, which points you directly to Jesus dealing with his people, physically the Jew. And, and so that really shows you that that's the theme. It gives you an idea of the emphasis of the book of Matthew. Again, the book of Matthew emphasized Jesus Christ is the earthly king of his earthly people, the Jews. This is why we have four gospels. Jesus Christ is a man. Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is a king. You can't have one gospel bear out all those aspects of Christ. You can't have one account show Jesus Christ as a king, a man, and God all at the same time. Those things, those things don't, you, you got to have multiple accounts to show these multiple functions or roles that Jesus Christ fulfilled. That's why we have Four Gospels. We could go in depth with this. We could go to a bunch of verses. But let me just give you this, and you remember this. You know this already. Matthew shows Jesus Christ as king of the Jews. Mark shows Jesus Christ as a servant. Luke shows Jesus Christ as the perfect man. And the book of John shows Jesus Christ as God, or God manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ fulfilled all those roles. But how in the world would you write a book that shows Jesus Christ as both a servant and a king? Kings aren't servants and servants aren't kings. It would be very difficult to show 
both of those aspects, Jesus Christ coming to serve and give himself a ransom for many, and Jesus Christ coming to rule with a rod of iron, how do you show those two personalities or functions of Christ in one book? What could be farther apart than a man and God? And yet Jesus Christ was both. And so how do you show the humanity of Christ and the deity of Christ at the same time? It can't be done. So we have four books that show the four different uh, things that Jesus Christ was or personalities or, or, or roles that he fulfilled. So that's the kingdom of heaven. Now I'm sure you're wondering about the kingdom of God. Come to Luke chapter 17. Simply enough, the kingdom of God's the opposite. Whereas the kingdom of heaven is physical, the kingdom of God is spiritual. Whereas the kingdom of heaven deals with only the Jew, the kingdom of God deals with anybody that is in Christ Jesus, the battery about to die. Getting low. Okay, I forgot to plug in. That's fine. We're almost done. Look at Luke 17. Man, that would really be bad to lose all this material because that battery died. Hang on. Luke 17. Uh, look at verse number 21. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So the kingdom of heaven. We had something that was physical, something was earthly, but Luke chapter 17 teaches us the kingdom of God is something that is spiritual. It is something that is within you. So there's a lot more that could be said about the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, but what we just went over is, is the basics, and it's absolutely vital to your understanding of the book of Matthew and the rest of the Gospels and really the rest of the Bible. You need to understand kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom in which you are placed when you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Kingdom of heaven is physical. Kingdom of heaven, book of Matthew, shows the emphasis of the book. Let, let, let me give you this stuff quickly, quickly. Let's talk about the Jewish nature of the book of Matthew. We told you it's primarily a Jewish book. We're not just going to tell you that without showing you that. The Jewish nature of the book of Matthew. Number one. Number one. Here's some reasons we can note to help us show us that this book's intended audience and underlying tone is Jewish. Number one. The genealogies in the book of Matthew are traced back to Abraham and David. The genealogies in Matthew are traced back to Abraham and and David. Remember, the book of Matthew shows Jesus the king of the Jews. Tracing him back to David shows his rightful place upon the throne, and tracing him back to Abraham shows that, in fact, that he is a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is a Jew. He is the king of the Jews. So it's, it's Jewish in emphasis. The other books, uh, Luke traces him back to Adam. Luke shows him as a man, and so it would make sense that Luke would take him all the way back to Adam. John, you open that first book, John shows Jesus Christ as, as, as God. When you open the first, what would be where the genealogies normally are, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's, that's his genealogical record in John. He's God. And in Mark, you don't have one because he's a servant. Nobody cares where a servant comes from. So that's interesting. But uh, Matthew shows him traced back to Abraham and David. Number two, Matthew is full, full of Old Testament references and quotations full of Old Testament references and quotations. While this is true of most New Testament books, you wouldn't have a New Testament if you didn't have an Old Testament. It is particularly true of Matthew. Matthew is filled with Old Testament references and quotations. Number three, the term son of David. The term son of David is used. This term is used three times in Luke, three times in Mark, but it's used ten times in the book of Matthew, which makes sense if you're talking about the king of the Jews. The, the whole New Testament, those verses we just read you, I mean the whole Old Testament is talking about David's seed, David's son. David's going to have a son to rule upon the throne. David, 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 David. And so it makes sense that Matthew would heavily connect Jesus Christ back to David. Number four, there are many references to the law of Moses. Many, many times the book says, the law of Moses says, the law of Moses says, and that kind of ties back to our second point, the fact that it's full of Old Testament references and quotations, but there's many references to the law of Moses. Number five, this is really interesting. 
Jewish customs are stated without explanation. Jewish customs are stated without explanation. Look at uh, Matthew 15 and Mark chapter 7. Get these two together. Mark 7 and Matthew 15. Just hang in there a couple more minutes. We're almost to our break. Matthew 15 and Mark 7. Look at Matthew 15, verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they do eat. But he answered and said unto them. So you have this Jewish custom of washing your hands before you eat in Matthew 15, but you don't really have any explanation. And why would you need an explanation if your audience is a Jew? Matthew's intended audience or main audience are Jewish people, and so they already know about this custom. They already know about what's going on here. The Bible says they wash not their hands when they eat bread. They're transitioning the custom. Of the no explanation about that custom. Now come to Mark 7. Look at verse number 1. Then came together unto him the Pharisees, same story, and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defile, that is, say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. Verse 3, for the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be, which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. So in Mark, you have two, three verses explaining this custom so you as a Gentile can say, oh, okay, now I understand. Because us filthy Gentiles, we're sitting here thinking, what's the big deal? What They eat with unwashed hands. What's that all about? Matthew skips the explanation. Why? Because it's written to a Jewish audience. They already know about it. We're not going to sit there and explain to a Jew Jewish customs. They've known that since they were a child. Okay, so that shows us that this book is Jewish. And that's, that happens many times in the book of, book of Matthew. Something will be mentioned and, and no explanation given. Number six, number six, two more. Matthew shows that the events of Jesus' life were the fulfillment of messianic prophecy. For example, the term that it might be fulfilled appears 10 times in the book of Matthew, which was spoken appears 14 times and was said six times. Matthew shows that the events of Jesus' life were the fulfillment of messianic prophecy. It focuses in on the fact that he fulfilled specifically messianic prophecy. Matthew uh, number 7, Matthew 10 shows the disciples being sent to the house of Israel and being forbidden to go to the Gentiles. Number 7, Matthew 10 shows the disciples being sent to the house of Israel and being forbidden to go to the Gentiles. So lastly, let's do this quickly. Let's take what we've learned and apply it to a passage. The book of all this information that's now swimming around your head and swimming on your page and and let's go to the book of Matthew and use this to actually clear up something that might otherwise be confusing. For example, Matthew chapter 5. Let's go here. Matthew 5. Matthew 5. This is what everybody calls the Sermon on the Mount, specifically this first part, the Beatitudes. Look at verse number 1, Matthew 5, 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Prior to our discussion, you might have been confused by these verses. In order to avoid the confusion and questions, most people approach these verses in a very simplistic manner. They'll come to these verses and say, well, see, the Bible says you ought to be meek, and you should be merciful, and you should be pure in heart. There's certainly that application that you can make from these verses, but if you think about it for any time at all, lots of confusing questions arise. For example, look at verse number three. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? If I'm poor in spirit, then I get to go to heaven? 
What, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Look at verse, verse number 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What is that supposed to mean? We can apply what we've learned, and it clears it all up. The kingdom of heaven is mentioned in verse 3 and in verse number 10. The kingdom of heaven is the physical kingdom on the earth. Matthew is a Jewish book that emphasizes the physical kingdom. Therefore, these are commandments and guidelines for the Jew on how to enter and live and govern their lives in the kingdom of heaven. Many a poor preacher has said, well, I don't know what to preach. Let's preach the Beatitudes. And they try to preach it as New Testament doctrine, and it's not. It's kingdom of heaven material. Are there things we can learn about it? Is there some application for us? Absolutely. But the main theme of this Sermon on the Mount is kingdom of heaven and Jewish. And as we go through the book of Matthew, you'll see many other examples of these truths that will clear up otherwise murky waters. Okay, so I almost hate to ask, do we have any questions? <laughs> any questions? Any further explanation? Okay, it's important. Don't be shy. If you do, if you don't understand that, you need this. Otherwise, you'll be confused the rest of the semester. All right, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for these truths. Help us to learn them, study them well, apply them to our lives. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.